level rises and that oxygen combines with luciferin and luciferase to make a light flash. But the light itself, the energy of the light actually will feed back um, on the bond, the chemical bond of nitric oxide with cytochrome C oxidase and cause it to release, to displace or photodissociate. Um, okay, so that brings up this whole inter interesting area of photobiology and turns out that biological, you know, there's a biological window on the near infrared uh, region between about 700 and 1100 nanometers that allows deep penetration. So when you shine a, a white light on your hand, um, you know, it casts a, a sharp shadow. But when you actually are able to shine a near infrared light um, and use a near infrared detector afterwards, you see a ghostly shadow on the wall with some penetration. It can go to three to five inches um, through bone. Um, the the um, main absorber turns out to be melanin. So dosing has to be uh, adjusted to, to correspond with uh, skin pigmentation for white, brown, and black skin pigments. So this can be called optodynamic therapy or ODT. And here's a, a device that's a little um, uh, headset uh, with uh, light emitting diodes that deliver um, uh, wavelengths between 830 and 870 nanometers. Um, and because you know, cloth doesn't absorb it, they can just put this on. And um, with six minute, two six minute treatments a week um, over uh, about six weeks, um, Jellicolite had uh, significant um, improvements in behavior and then also in uh, some other biomarkers that include delta wave uh, changes on the EEG. And they'll talk to you this afternoon about that. But anyway, so when, how to put all that together with everything that I've just been talking to you about. So. One thing that can what that happens um, during normal um, uh, the healing response is nitric oxide is produced and then will bind to cytochrome C oxidase. Turns out nitric oxide also binds cysteine beta thion thi cysteine uh, beta cystothionine beta synthase. Excuse me, CBS. Okay, and the and the B type heme in in CBS. And, and so what happens when that, that you can imagine that, that um, this actually can prevent mitochondria from consuming more oxygen and lock cells um, uh, in, the, in, a, in a kind of, in, uh, in, in the different stages of the cell cycle. This, but if you can displace the nitric oxide and, and tip the ramp, um, uh, so that mitochondria and cells um, can progress through healing, um, then, then what you can see is a, a decrease in extracellular ATP and reactive oxygen, ammonia, you know, hydrogen sulfide, and, and a progression of cells um, through the, the stages of the healing that are necessary um, in order to reestablish vigorous health again. Um, and, and the biomarkers that you'll heal about this afternoon include the EEG delta power and increase uh, respiratory sinus arrhythmia or heart rate variability for autonomic and vagal tone monitoring. So to summarize, antipurinergic therapies um, uh, um, include uh, ceramin and other drugs, that antipurinergic drugs, APDs that are being developed, and PNX and channel blocking for PNX. So, so those um, companies involved, um, so, so both, both Pax Medica and a company named Kuzani are, are developing ceramin for autism. And then, uh, uh, then a company called Panex Therapeutics is developing PNX3 and other drugs to block, block extracellular ATP efflux through PNX and channels. And ODT is being developed by um, Jellicolet. So overall, the, what are the take home messages? So my, the main message is that knowledge of pathogenesis is not sufficient to, to restart salogenesis. Okay, so you need both. You actually need to understand both the cause of, uh, of, of disease and, and then what might be inhibiting the, the progression of, of healing after, um, after injury or trauma. And so, so that's the second point is the abnormal persistence of the cell danger response that creates these blocks. And that, another important thing is that they're really, they're, concrete, objective, structural, and functional changes in mitochondria that have to occur. If you have one type of mitochondria, you would die. 
Okay. It, you cannot have just M2 mitochondria all the time. Okay. You must be able to cycle or you'll be overtaken by infection um, and unable to fight off uh, you know, um, uh, disease. So, so in the process of doing this requires a reestablishment of flow and unflattening of the cellular thermodynamic gradients between organelles, cells and organs. And then you know, the other interesting thing is that we can find, we find that patients can become hypersensitive to their own ATP signaling. So even though ATP release can, is normal and, and seen after any vaccine in, in healthy kids and children with autism, children with autism respond um, differently. Okay. And the other important thing is that, that this hyperpurinergia response is, it affects so many different pathways that these pathways are all coordinated to respond you know, in, uh, in kind. And then it, and the, you know, that, that ATP signaling regulates genes and proteins and biochemical pathways, GI inflammation, microbiome, immune system, microglia, autonomic and neuroendocrine factors. So overall, what are the conclusions? So metabolism one is the main driver and key feature of chronic illness and health and mitochondria and mitochondrial associated membranes are the integration platform that regulates the system. The cell danger response coordinates all the subsystems and blocks and salogenesis can derail child development and cause chronic illness. The problem that, that we run into is a practical one. So good science turns out can identify layers of truth that are absolutely you know, easily documented in every different disease, okay? Whether that's oxygen electrons, gene expression, mitochondria, ATP um, signaling, cell danger response, healing and everything and many more okay but the the question really is is by regulated we're intervening at, at at a particular layer of truth can we alter the overall system and one way that we found that you can do that in a way that ends up being by metabolomics being shown to to be the most connected to all other layers of of the system ends up being atp signaling it's the metabolic nexus point so if you're interested in learning more about this, there's, I'm a, a, a chair for the, the Mitochondrial Medicine Conference um, uh, put on by the United Mitochondrial Disease Foundation this June. It'll be our first in-person in uh, conference in two years. And there's a whole session uh, on mitochondria, autism, and inflammation. So I'll stop there and, and give my thanks to the UCSD Christini Fund and the Brain Foundation and to everyone for your patience and, and, and attention. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Navio. Here are some questions. We will take questions till 2.15 and then proceed with the next uh, speaker because we have some time for questions. Sure. I have um, posted some questions from our community uh, on the chat and uh, if you could answer them there, that'll be good. But these are questions specifically for Dr. Navio. Um, we know you are not a clinician, but the desperate situation warrants this question. When do you assume this treatment will be available for children to take? And we have many parents with children aged nine to 10 desperate to use it before puberty. Right, so, so, um... Short answer is, is that the, the next clinical trials of serum in the United States are scheduled for 2022, okay? And, and so those, so there was, uh, and, and the next ones will, will um, uh, keep expanding the number. Ultimately, there'll be probably two phase three clinical trials of at least 300 kids each across 10 to 20 different centers across North America that'll be required in order to generate the data that the FDA needs for safety and efficacy determination and, and for final approval. So that process could go as fast as three years if we get accelerated um, uh, approvals from, from the FDA. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm with you that this, is, this has been you know, uh, a very slow process. I mean, we started all this work back in 2008 and here we are 13 years later um, and still, still working on developing the clinical trials. But, um, Every time it's been tested in a clinical trial, um, antipurinergic therapy has worked in autism spectrum disorder. Um, and so we just uh, need to, to you know, expand that and, and, and hopefully we'll have more answers each year for the next few years until um, with you know, uh, you know, 
if the data supports it, um, we'll have it available. Um, hopefully, so there, less there than five more, years. Yeah. Uh, there are two more related questions. Will the next studies enroll girls and adults? Yeah. So absolutely. The so girls are are absolutely going to be part of the um, of next clinical trials. Um, uh, it, there's a practical issue that in order to achieve the same statistical um, confidence level, you have to have the same number of girls as boys um, uh, in a study. You can't just mix, you know, one fourth the number of, of boys as girls um, in the study. Um, girls and boys respond differently, and they have different symptom complexes um, just in general. Um, uh, but you know, the purpose of the next clinical trials is going to be to try to um, see, ask the question, is it, is sermon safe and effective in girls with autism as well as boys? Okay, so, so yes, there will be. Considering the longer runtime, would you know whether the improvements were sustained for longer than six months after the trial? Ah, so, so, um, what we know is just one dose is not enough, okay? One dose, you know, that it, you know, we can detect, you know, blood levels for, um, you know, about six weeks, but after eight weeks, um, the children, for the most part, return to their pre-treatment um, uh, condition, with the exception of some, you know, kind of uh, more crystallized pieces of, of knowledge or learning that they did during the time, like, you know, so being able to tie your shoelaces for the first time, children were able to continue doing that afterwards. Uh, but but the overall benefits in language and social behavior and sleep and microbiome and gut issues, you know, um, kind of return over a period of a couple months uh, after one dose. But the overall, the next treatments are designed to be three to six months, you know, and ask the question after three to six months uh, of treatment, you know, can we change, you know, the trajectory of child development and, and, um, and improve the outcome uh, for, for those children and families? Do you expect the, that the combined action of a drug like suramin and PNX channel blocker may be additive or complementary? Oh, I, I absolutely think they will be synergistic, not just additive. They will be synergistic. Okay, so I, I, I absolutely think that they will be synergistic. I do also think that um, even ODT has a chance of being synergistic with those other two therapies. So they're all, every, all these are therapies are going, you know, getting at reestablishment of gradients in mitochondria. And that, that's, it's really about thermodynamics. It's, it's not just supporting mitochondrial function because somebody who's knowledgeable about this could just say, which mitochond which of the, 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 the 700 mitochondrial functions are we supporting? Well, and the answer is, it depends on which stage of the cell, of, of the, the healing cycle you're in. And ultimately what you need is, give the support and then unblock the system so that the, 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 the system can rebalance itself. Next one was related. Uh, do you anticipate the um, photobiomodulation therapy to be as effective as antipyrinergic? No data. I have no, I, what I can tell you is from what I see now, the magnitude of the treatment effects is slightly smaller for the same duration, you know, for six weeks, looking at six, uh, the six week outcome time point, it's slightly smaller for ODT than for, um, you know, antipyrinergic. But, uh, you know, I think that it's still being optimized. And I think that, that is, there's a great potential for it to, to improve. And, and ultimately, each one of these three different, you know, interventions is going to have a uh, you know, a significant impact and, and, you know, only the science will eventually tell us on, you know, which ones, uh, you know, are, are best alone and in combination. Thank you. Um, we have finished the questions that were posted. If there are any more questions, please post them and he can um, perhaps respond on the Q&A. Thank you so much, Dr. Navio. It was short notice and it was a great presentation. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you. Okay. Bye.